Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another session at Room for Discussion. Uh, our topic of today is as pressing as the two regions that it addresses. We're going to be talking about China's economic involvement in the European Union. So, according to Bloomberg, over the last 10 years, China has invested some $318 billion, uh, and that's 50% more than what it has invested in the United States. And over the same amount of time, uh, China has acquired some 360 European firms, whether these are automobile manufacturers or just football clubs. But despite the gravity of these investments, the European Union has been slow and divided over how to uh, counteract China's influence uh, in Europe and its growing economic involvement. Maybe more alarmingly, this is a, a time where we see China becoming more authoritarian at home, whether it's the crackdown of protesters at Hong Kong or the mass attention of Muslim Uyghurs. So what exactly this one-party state, what its actions will do for the European Union and its society remain to be seen? Uh, so our first guest today is Mr. T. Stumps. He's the author of The New Kaiser, a biography of Xi Jinping. Uh, Mr. Dams also works at the Klingenal Institute uh, of International Relations. Um, and our second guest is Mr. Alexander Lagazi, who works at Europeum, a, a Prague-based think tank, and he has also published uh, several articles on EU-China relations. So without further ado, please uh, give a warm round of applause for our guests. Merci. <laughs> Great to have you here. <laughs> so most people are aware of Western investment in China and of course China's tense relationship with USA. However, little is talked about China's activity in Europe, despite the immense size of the investments coming into the continent. So Mr. Lagazi, why has Europe's relations with China been so neglected in the public sphere on this issue? Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor. Um, I believe that um, it's uh, a bit of an issue that uh, is very sensitive, especially I see that uh, within the V4 countries, for example. Uh, if I may speak for the Czech Republic, for example, uh, our relations towards uh, China were uh, quite different uh, according to, for example, the president as we had. We had um, the, His Holiness the Dalai Lama coming over, and then we welcomed also Xi Jinping. Um, at the same time, our uh, Minister of um, Culture met with the, His Holiness the Dalai Lama while our government was uh, assuring the uh, Chinese ambassador that that's not our official policy. So uh, within the public discourse, for example, especially in the Czech Republic, but I can think that I can extend that at least to the V4 as well, it's um, a bit of a sensitive issue, especially as, uh, for example, with what happened in Ukraine, uh, I believe that uh, the EU somehow may be um, underestimated uh, while dealing with Ukraine, the role of China in the region, uh, meant in the Western Balkan, for example. So um, the sensitivity of the issue, I think it's, it's the, core, the core problem. Okay, but you think that in, in Europe, it, is it uh, already as sensitive as it is, for example, in the United States? Um, I believe that as of now, especially looking at the trade relations between the two, uh, uh, giants, uh, it is becoming very sensitive, sensitive, especially coming back to, for example, the FDI screenings that uh, the Juncker Commission has proposing uh, mm -hmm. or proposed uh, one year ago. That's definitely a uh, uh, way of uh, somehow responding to this influx of uh, Chinese investments. And um, I think that also the fact that it's very reactive, meaning it's uh, um, the EU trying to, uh, looking a lot towards China in these uh, screenings, uh, trying to maybe um, defend itself on in certain sectors, mm -hmm. uh, especially, for example, technology, uh, where uh, it is possible that uh, the role of Chinese investments might be uh, seen as a threat. Okay. Well, then let's just start with talking about China's economic uh, influence in Europe. So in 2017, the total amount of EU to China foreign direct investment was the same level as the China to EU foreign direct investment. Uh, Mr. Dams, do you see this as an organic outcome of China's economic development or more of a specific uh, strategy, a geopolitical strategy? Um, well, I think it's both. Uh, okay. So, um, uh, when looking at Xi Jinping's policy priorities and um, indeed that of his, of his predecessors, uh, China's home 
grown economic development has always been at the forefront and that would automatically at some point uh, lead to growing foreign investment and a growing um, uh, presence in, in foreign economies. Um, and China is, uh, and I think that's one of the sensitivities that you also point to, um, is quite aware of the ge geopolitical ramifications um, such a growing economic presence in on the world stage uh, would have and is now having and has so and for that reason has been trying to also uh, design those economic relations in a way that when for instance a United States would mm -hmm. become angry and try to mm -hmm. push it back which it now has begun to do uh, it would be able to pull on all sorts of strings to uh, uh, to keep going so um, I think it's both and I think one of the, the sensitivities or one of the taboos that China's rise is now uh, forcing to forcing Europe to give up is this illusory separation of um, economics of the market and of power of geopolitics um, so one of the, 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 the most uncomfortable things in coming to recognize that China you know the debate about China isn't just about us judging China on its economic political uh, merits or faults mm -hmm. but it's about China changing our reality and uh, you know ways in which we have to deal with that is uh, recognizing that we need a certain kind of geopolitical and geoeconomic muscle that we basically have forgotten to use because uh, well for various reasons we can go into that mm -hmm. later I think is this situation unique to Europe or is this also relevant for say what's happening in Africa the no, investment I, that's happening in Africa so I think one of the exciting things is that it um, especially now in uh, the, the growing conflict between the US and China, it um, gives rise to a growing awareness of middle powers all across the world that um, we're in the same boat. So uh, no, this isn't, isn't just an European issue, this is an issue for East Asia, for African uh, countries, mm -hmm. and it's actually an issue that binds us together, so it gives reason for us to work together and to see those countries as allies um, and potential partners uh, because we there's two ha uh, competing hegemons and the rest <laughs> needs to figure out how to how to deal with that mm -hmm. so as Ongu mentioned in his introduction speech uh, China is investing across several different industries so whether it's in robotics companies in Germany mm. or a port in Greece or whether it's football clubs in the UK or even property here in Amsterdam uh, which types of investments should be the biggest concern for Europe, Mr. Legazi? Uh, well, I believe that, uh, and, and if I am allowed to I'd just come back a bit to the Western Balkans to say that, uh, to answer your question, and that is this, uh, in the very first, uh, in the beginning of uh, Chinese investments in the Western Balkans, uh, the infrastructure was mainly, uh, transport infrastructure was mainly tackled. And that's a uh, pretty uh, logical or a logical way to do uh, business for China, giving the Belt and Road Initiative that it's basically coming up uh, from the port of Piraeus in Greece up to, uh, through Serbia to uh, then Hungary and uh, you know, uh, exploring then the European market. So um, at the beginning it, it was seen in the Western Balkans especially that it's mainly transportation and infrastructure connected transport, so highways and, 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 and railways, especially the case for example of the railway from uh, Belgrade to Budapest, which was uh, a, a very sensitive topic for Hungary as well because obviously uh, welcoming that investment was not in line with the EU regulations. Um, but um, as of now, and that's uh, where I'm answering your question, uh, in especially in the Western Balkan, China has shifted towards the energy sector, toward technologies mm. as well. Yep. And that's, I think, where uh, coming also back to the FDI, uh, screening, uh, screening of investments from the EU is uh, the potential uh, threatening of, of, of these sectors that the EU has to uh, be worri worried about, and especially when talking to new technologies like um, AI or even the backlash or over the 5G um, uh, mobile system. I think that's, yep. that's where the future of... But has the region in general been better off because of this foreign direct investment in China, would you say? Um, I believe that not at all, uh, not completely, but uh, the problem was that uh, in the Western Balkan especially, what happened was that uh, the countries that were not in the EU and possibly are looking into you know, the um, uh, possibility of uh, a future membership, welcome investments in such sectors that uh, in, in such an amount that are uh, destabilizing, for example, the economic system of the countries. And that's obviously something that goes against the prospect of joining the EU on, uh, in, in, in the nearest future. Mm 
Yeah, and it's just, and, and, and I completely agree. And to add to that, I think uh, it's not about sort of cost-benefit analysis of short-term economic gains. It's about who owns the fourth industrial revolution and therefore owns the military and geopolitical power instruments of the coming decades. Um, and uh, uh, so it's, it's not just investments aren't, it's not just the economy, stupid. Uh, Bill Clinton would have not said. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but something like that. OK. Um, so not only which investments are important, but knowing who is doing all the buying is crucial mm. to understanding how such activity fits into China's official and unofficial foreign policy aims and what is just pure Chinese business interests. So Mr. Dumps, to what degree is it important to distinguish between state-owned Chinese businesses and private Chinese businesses when it comes to investment in Europe? Um, well, it is, it is an important distinction. Uh, and, and having said that, uh, it's becoming, within, within Xi Jinping's China, it's becoming increasingly difficult to make, um, uh, distinct, to make that distinction, basically. So uh, we also see a lot of political influence with so-called private companies. Uh, operating in China and operating abroad. So when it comes to checking political influence, uh, it's very hard to do that just by looking at ownership structures uh, when, it comes to, when it comes to China. Mm -hmm. But how does the incentivization work? So for example, I'm a Chinese businessman. Does the government come knock at my door and say, you have to invest in these specific parts of Europe? Is it incredibly uh, strategically tailored or is it a more free market approach? It's very unique to China. It's not something we see here in the Netherlands. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's incredibly opaque. So often we don't know. And mm -hmm. that's the big issue. Um, uh, and I mean, so I guess also it, it happens on a, on, on, a, on a personal and cultural level. So, so, uh, so we don't know the, the, the kind of influence China has on Huawei, for instance. I mean, there aren't sort of r records of that. Um, but we do know that you know, the founder of Huawei was able to grow because of um, uh, party support. Actually, he wanted to get rich to get into the Communist Party because that was the place to be, and he couldn't do that at first. So there's a huge sort of cultural interwovenness, the interconnection between um, business and state that, that can't just be separated by sort of um, um, well, that is very opaque and very ubiquitous, mm -hmm. and therefore ca you can't really uh, pinpoint where the influence is, but it's there. Uh, um, and if even if it's not here, it might be, or it will be, when, for instance, Huawei becomes uh, the subject of, you know, big international disputes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I, I, I guess I would frame it like that, but to wait for a, a smoking gun is, I, I think, uh, to wait in vain. Mm -hmm. If I may just yeah, elaborate on uh, the vagueness, uh, I think that that's actually something that divided within the 16 plus one, now called 17 plus one platform. Uh, that's also a very divisive um, issue between the V4 states and the members of the EU, the eight members, I believe, of the EU within the 16 plus one and the Western Balkans, because what happened, for example, with Chinese investments is that uh, for the, those states that are under EU regulation, uh, there were a lot of promises, a lot of uh, memorandums of understanding and uh, you know, business deal yet to be made, but uh, it all came down to the question of following or not following EU regulation. So where the EU regulation was in place, uh, it was very uh, difficult for China to approach um, within this sort mm. of way of business to approach the countries, whereas in the Western Balkans, it was exactly the opposite. Uh, the investments were welcomed, obviously, because uh, it was, it was al almost portrayed as an alternative to the EU, mm -hmm. money coming from China, but the uh, vagueness of, of how exactly these deals are you know, being made, how exactly are the conditions then uh, laid down on the table is what I think uh, is especially for the EU versus Western Balkan countries or non-EU countries very divisive as well. Mm -hmm. And there's also uh, certain cultural aspects that come with this. Uh, when we think about Western uh, uh, foreign direct investment, we think that it would help countries open up, become maybe more democratic. Uh, Mr. Lagazi, do you think that Chinese investment to Europe comes with a similar kind of value package? Um, I think that it does, uh, even though it might be very subtle. 
-hmm. uh, again, coming back to, for example, Serbia, uh, uh, I, when I was studying and researching the relation between Serbia, for example, and, and, and China, it was very interesting to see that there were uh, very uh, big common issues. One of them, obviously, is being sovereignty, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Serbia having an enormous powerful ally, China, mm -hmm in the uh, issue of Kosovo, for example, um, and um, as well uh, within the NATO bombings of Kosovo, of course, the embassy of China was, was one of the buildings that was hit. Mm -hmm. So those are issues that uh, uh, are used, for example, in China, uh, from, uh, from China then to align Serbia in voting, for example, the UN on certain resolutions in favor of, of the China stance. Uh, but um, again, coming back to the, uh, the EU, I believe that uh, there, what what the, if for example, even if the eye screenings are also uh, kind of trying to tackle is uh, exactly this, that if we allow int uh, some um, economic uh, influence to come in from China, then we need to be on board also with political interests, and uh, those have to be aligned with the EU. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Dams, what do you think? I, I completely agree. I think, so for instance, uh, looking at the way China is selling the Belt and Road Initiative, mm -hmm. uh, and, and especially in the sort of the very visible, uh, like the videos and the commercials and the, um, uh, uh, you, you could say propaganda, um, it is clearly trying to sell a story for, a, a value-laden story for what a, a new world order should look like and why China is about to bring it on. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, uh, the, the, the story that China is just a, um, you know, an economic partner is only focused on rational uh, uh, costs and benefits is, uh, I think it's, it's yesterday's news. So uh, it was a strategy purposefully pursued, and I think wisely pursued by the Chinese government to sell that kind of you know, business-like CCP image to the rest of the world and especially to the West. Um, uh, but it was, one, fake to begin with, mm -hmm. and two, uh, it's no longer doing that quite so explicitly. So especially in communication to uh, um, other East Asian countries and, and African countries and South American countries, it is quite purposefully um, and quite explicitly um, uh, showing its economic and great power rise as a way of emancipation from Western uh, domination to all those other countries. So that has a clear post-colonial, I think, ideological component. Mm -hmm. And it goes, I mean, it guess, I guess it goes back to Marx, uh, Karl Marx, uh, so when I give talks in the country uh, about uh, China, P people often ask me this question, and I ask, uh, you know, does China have an ideology uh, aside from making money and you know becoming bigger? Uh, um, and it uh, uh, the question really is, what constitutes an ideology? So, um, uh, so what I notice is that the regular sort of Dutch person would think of ideology as the first couple of points in a political program, right? So we're liberal and democratic and blah blah blah. Um, but when you look at what Marx wrote about, you know, the German ideology, for instance, it's the kind of things that, you know, it's the way you view the world without you knowing that that's the way you view the world, because that is basically the way you view the world. Mm -hmm. So it is the inherent normative aspect um, of all those seemingly rational things you do. So, of course, China has a huge ideological impact on the world because it has a huge impact on the balance of power in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I think... I mean, we can pinpoint various strands. There's post-colonial sort of emancipation from the West. There's a sense of high-tech utopianism, trying to sell the idea that, mm -hmm. you know, to click here, save everything. Um, you have Genny Morozov wrote that wonderful book that, you know, high-tech solutions can do all sorts of, uh, solve all sorts of international and national social issues. Um, and I think there's other, you know, nationalistic and indeed, indeed still some communist strands of ideology in, in China's internationalist presence. Um, but the fact that it is ideological is often the most surprising. Mm -hmm. But we also see, I mean, as you mentioned, countries in Eastern and Southern Europe also being part of this. Is it, uh, is it just because they simply like being, like receiving the investment or does it also stress some kind of dissatisfaction they have with the EU as a, as a bloc? Right, I think like that us. for sure the issue of dissatisfaction is there uh, especially if you think about uh, within the 16 plus one countries, uh, those uh, the V4 are all post-communist countries, and um, they are 
probably even seen in the last years as a bit of a troublemaker within the EU countries. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, but also for Italy, the definitely there is the notion of you know, being kind of left out from the EU. And I think that where, where China is marketizing this approach of doing business very uh, eagerly and, and easily is exactly that, uh, and that's what then in Brussels is becoming a problem, uh, is that there might be this trying to pr be, be portrayed as an opportunity and an alternative to the EU which obviously for the EU is, 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 is becoming a threat. Um, uh, so uh, for sure, I believe that uh, especially in the V4 countries, but also the southern countries like Italy, uh, Greece possibly with the, with the port of Piraeus, uh, are all connected to this notion of you know, um, getting the money elsewhere if needed. But um, what I see, especially, for example, the response for the EU from uh, the last EU-China strategic outlook of last year of Juncker's commission, is that, that already there it was very critical towards China. Mm -hmm. And what was uh, being said is that it's a strategic partner and competitor. Mm -hmm. So this response, I think, ties in into the fact that some countries, uh, even though are might feel le as, as left out from the EU and welcoming Chinese investments, are still um, obviously forced to um, be under the EU regulation and, 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 and basically welcome investments in the right way. Mm -hmm. And uh, by coming up with something like an FDI screening is, is, might be a way of um, trying to uh, get a unanimous and common approach toward China, yeah. which is, I think, the key to get you know, uh, a win-win yeah. situation for Rio. Yeah. We will talk more about that later as well. So Beijing expects that its economic influence will translate into lasting uh, uh, diplomatic leverage in Europe. Mr. Dams, will this prevent the EU from taking a unified position on human rights issues like what's happening in Tibet, the mass detention of in Uyghurs, and on geopolitical issues like Taiwan and the militarization of the South China Sea. Yeah, so it has already, right? So the the, the um, uh, you know Greece has already vetoed a UN Human Rights Council um, uh, what do you call it uh, proposition uh, by the EU that was intended to be brought in by the EU. Uh, quite, you know, obviously due to Chinese pressure. Um, uh, I'm quite excited. Well, excited is completely the wrong word, but I'm very interested, eagerly looking forward to, but also um, <laughs> quite disturbed by the way, for instance, uh, um, uh, UK political discourse is going to change after Brexit due to the fact that it will have to quite desperately uh, cater to both um, Trumpian American, but also Russian and especially Chinese uh, political voices to, to to get the kind of funds and you know uh, political leverage it it then desperately needs. So uh, um, we might see it you know at the the, the global Britain uh, uh, um, discourse uh, changing quite rapidly too, um, and and indeed I mean there's. Uh, uh, there's some connections, there seem to be some connections between uh, European political parties and, and Chinese influence. Eh? The, the, the Alternative for Deutschland, uh, our, our, our colleagues from, from the far right in Germany, um, often uh, go for a cup of tea at the Chinese embassy in return with, um, uh, let's say, post-liberal slogans or anti-liberal slogans uh, or anti-democratic slogans. Um, that uh, have been written up in Beijing. So um, I think we've, for, all, for decades, have underestimated China as a rising economic power. We're sort of getting over that now. Mm -hmm. Now we're starting to recognize China as a geopolitical power, but China as a cultural and ideological and normative influence on the world is uh, um, often quite beyond the imagination of uh, Western European um, you know, uh, political cultures, but it's, it's happening. Okay, um, at this point I'm going to turn to the audience. Um, does anyone have uh, any question at this point? Uh, yes, gentleman over here at the front. Hi, so wh wh what would you say are the main reasons that the EU has so much underestimated China's influence? Well, if I may start, I, I think it's uh, pretty connected to the fact that, uh, in a way, the EU has been pretty busy with sorting itself out, uh, very, very frankly. Um, so, first of all, uh, we have been 
uh, we've, we've seen you know, the, the, the backlash over especially the V4 countries over migration quotas, then Brexit, uh, and then also the shift of you know, American politics towards uh, maybe closing down a bit the, the, the transatlantic partnership with the EU. So there's definitely a, a, a quite a reflection of what the EU is now uh, trying to be uh, also after Brexit, uh, after the EU will actually leave, uh, how will that change the perspective of different countries. But um, I, I feel like, especially uh, talking about China, there is the uh, good old tandem of Germany, Franco-German axis that is still working, uh, and also uh, tying into the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, that's where I see, uh, for example, the uh, platforms like the 16 or 17 plus one, if you may, uh, are tying in to just connect to the uh, German market. So overall, from economic perspective, I believe that uh, the EU will remain on the same level as, 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 as of now, which means uh, if we we're gonna talk business, then uh, only within EU regulation. Mm. Um, uh, uh, perhaps even more fundamentally, it's it's about. To d I think it's also to do with uh, being a dominant power in the world. So not having to, for quite a long time, have to reckon with the fact that you'll be influenced um, as much as you're influencing others. So it's a, uh, 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 um, you know, the 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 blindness you get from being uh, on top of on the top of the pyramid, I guess. Um, and uh, outside of the real sort of harsh geopolitical battles going on, or at least being in a place that, you know, uh, uh, together with or, or, or guarded by the United States, you, you didn't have to face the, the ugliest parts of it. So, um, um, and, and of course, that's China's using that blindness quite uh, effectively. Um, and it has used, in particular, the, 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 the quagmires in the Middle East following uh, 2001. Uh, the Western has been engaged in uh, especially very well to, um, uh, uh, um, well, bide its time, but not really. Okay, um, so I want to kind of move on to, uh, Mr. Lagazi, what you mentioned, the European Union issued a, a EU-China strategic outlook. Uh, and it's, it's quite recent. Could you maybe explain its, its basic points to the audience and, and it's also its significance? Well, um, as I said before, uh, th I think that the main point of this strategic outlook, it's it basically um, um, the, 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 the key document that the uh, Commission uses to uh, pave the way to relations with China. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, as uh, opposed to the previous ones, this one is the first who, which is really um, uh, being reactive and, and, and constructively um, uh, criticizing uh, what what uh, is uh, what is the state of EU-China relation? That's mostly because of um, the fact of reciprocity. Reciprocity is one of the biggest and, and most used word when it comes to uh, business with China, and that's uh, easily because of the ca of the fact that uh, China is very eager to invest in in the EU and and, and, and uh, export um, capital, but when it comes down to the um, on, on the other way around, which means for EU companies to approach the Chinese market, it's being very, very difficult to um, um, either uh, just survive in such uh, um, very competitive conditions or to get the legislation done to just being able to be uh, do doing business with China. And that also ties in uh, with uh, what, what Juncker uh, has been saying for quite a while, and that is if China is portraying itself as so eager to do business, uh, well, why does not uh, why does not work uh, uh, the other way around for us to get our companies to actually work in China? Do you see China being receptive to this message? Um, I think that um, as for uh, official stances, uh, there were uh, I, I believe there were some commentaries uh, saying that of course uh, China is doing everything it can to alleviate the, for example, amount of bureaucracy that there is to um, get uh, get companies in China. But uh, if you look at numbers, I don't think that's yet still the case. And so what should the answer be, Mr. Nams? Should the answer be that we as Europe should also become more protectionist in what we allow to be invested in Europe? Um, I, I think to some extent, but maybe it's not so much about closing markets as uh, about flexing geopolitical muscle. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and trying to find ways in which you can, mm -hmm. that, you know, ways that China is finding that you can open up to the world economically and still uh, maintain um, a sense of strategic autonomy. So I think 
that's that's one of the very strong points in the in the, the strategic outlook, uh, the EU strategic outlook when it comes to China, is that it, it acknowledges that importance, um, and um, it breaks that taboo of the EU also being you know or uh, also being a geopolitical actor. Mm -hmm. I think um, one of the you know the the, the Dutch China strategy, uh, which uh, has had always has always also been published, uh, is that it recognizes the fact that. It can't. It's. It can't act alone. So it has to act through the EU. It's. I mean, the China strategy is. There's all sorts of faults with it, but that recognition is quite strong and 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 and, um, and powerful. And uh, actually, now with the new commission um, set up by uh, Ursula von der Leyen, um, I think it's. It's sort of. It's appearing to miss a chance to really uh, grasp that opportunity. So it's. Uh, it, it could have made a public sort of place, for instance, a commissioner that would explicitly embrace the fact that it has to connect uh, geopolitics and economics. For instance, uh, by, by setting up a, a commission for uh, economic security. Um, and now what seems to be happening is that, you know, Ursula von der Leyen wants to take, take on that geopolitical role, but she wants to do that herself, and she wants to mostly do that through... Uh, um, uh, you know, on cabinet level, so not with a public, you know, for all Europeans to be recognized person, uh, but to do it, you know, more uh, 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 through through her bureaucracy and do it personally. And I think that's a missed chance. So it's, I think it should have been a sort of a public acknowledgement that, you know, Europe is trying to get its geopolitical mm -hmm. um, act in order um, and, um, uh, uh, and is not doing that so publicly now. And I think that will influence the way we talk about, for instance, protectionism, because then there's still a sense of urgen urgency amongst the public uh, that, you know, we have to do something and maybe we should close our borders or should close our markets. Um, so I think that's quite, that's a missed chance, but it's more about flexing geopolit geopolit geopolitical muscle rather than uh, closing markets. I but think. Uh, how does the EU become, uh, get its geopolitical act together while at the same time acknowledging that China is, you know, by some measures already the biggest economy in the world, uh, how do you how do you couple these two things? What what sort of uh, policy should the EU pursue? Well, um, well, that's a, I mean that's that's the question and a, and a very big one. Um, and and I think there's a couple of uh, at least a couple of directions that are you know being found right now. So it's one is acknowledging the fact that economics and power can't be separated. So that mm -hmm. when it comes to ch Europe's place in the world it should take both in account. Mm -hmm. um, two, that you know, Europe should really has to start working hard in revitalizing and modernizing its, uh, and, and the, the, the term has been spoiled also by the new cabinet, uh, by, or the new commission uh, von der Leyen, but its way of life. So it has to start investing in, in, uh, uh, in ways that, you know, within the neoliberal consensus of the last decades, uh, it was taboo to do so. Um, and I think it, the, the third strand is a certain measure of what's called strategic autonomy or strategic sovereignty, mm -hmm. uh, which means basically being able to operate as a geopolitic, geopolitical actor um, uh, independently of the US and China. Mm -hmm. um, and right now it has virtually no uh, capacity to really claim to that status, but it, the change has been enormous as I think a year ago or two years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, the urgency of developing that kind of autonomy wasn't even recognized. Mm -hmm. So um, it will have to change the way geopolitics is, is uh, um, uh, or geopolitical strategy is discussed within the European Union. Um, it ha has already set some things in motion to do so. Um, uh, uh, and uh, um, it will have to find platforms to discuss those things mm -hmm. earlier on and not just reactively. Uh, but it's, I mean, you can think of all kinds of ways to do that, but it's, it, 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 I think we're now at the point of recognizing its urgency rather than mm -hmm. already finding uh, ways to do it. And do you agree with that, Mr. Lecker? I'm in full agreement, and, mm -hmm. and, and I would only like to stress that as, as hard as it, as it sounds, uh, the, the real problem, uh, which is also voiced in Brussels, is that when it comes to the uh, EU-China relations, there really needs to be a very unified common voice mm -hmm. for all the states. 
Um, I've been, uh, when I was researching the uh, influence of China in, in the Western Balkans, usually um, the real obstacle uh, for, uh, for example, Chinese companies to come to the EU states within the 16 plus one was that they uh, were not sure how to interpret the fact that some of the um, laws and regulations of those countries, which would be normally you know, um, uh, challenged on a bilateral level, were uh, being pushed up on an EU level. Mm -hmm. So the country might have been in agreement with welcoming any investment, yep. but then the issue or the, or the problem was that uh, at the end of the day, it wasn't up exactly to that government to decide, but to decide with, the, with agreement of EU regulation. And that's, uh, I hope, uh, one of the challenges, but also opportunity, which I yeah. think uh, would, would be, can be tackled within the FDI screening system, but also with a reshuffling of forces within the EU after Brexit. But of course, the question so is So connected to this, hmm? it seems that investments coming from the EU have different standards than those of Chinese investments. Hmm. Um, so the ones that come from the EU often come with democratic requirements. So should the EU then change to become more lenient with its criteria concerning rule of law and an independent judicial system, which is made, uh, which is a requirement for EU financial support? Um, I don't with think so. I think uh, rather than changing that, it should be able to portray itself as, as perhaps the messenger of this. Uh, I believe that what's happening, for example, with Do you not think that Hungary chooses investments from China over that from the EU because of these factors? Uh, that might be definitely one of the reasons, but also, uh, you know, if you think about what's happening in Hungary, the problem is then on, 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 on what extent does Hungary want to actually follow uh, these, uh, um, these rules that comes with the EU investments. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that, especially in the case of the uh, Belgrade-Budapest railway, when uh, the EU originally said uh, that it's not a problem to um, you know, welcome that kind of investment if it will follow certain rules which uh, the country as such has to follow as a member of the EU. And what happened was that the Hungarian government basically ignored the rules. And then, of course, the backlash came back from the commission with, with a fine. Yeah. So, you know, if Hungary would have listened instead in the first place, I believe that they would, be, uh, they would have come to an agreement that uh, would still build a ra railway, but, you know, within, within the, the amendments that, that, that the EU wanted. Yeah. I th I, I've been thinking uh, quite a bit about Karl Popper th lately, um, who in his, uh, um, the Open Society and its enemies in the introduction, quite beautifully and, and succinctly writes about how the open society is thr threatened, um, and he, he talks about real threats, which is something else than having a competitor, for instance, but still, is threatened um, you know, continuously, and always people uh, uh, within that open society argue that it should change to stay safe. So basically, it can't stay open and free if it wants to stay secure. And... Um, uh, and, and I think his genius lay in the fact, not just in the ideal of the open society per se, but in his insistence that um, uh, it is exactly an open society that is able to plan for security and freedom. So uh, to, uh, 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 to develop capacities that it can you know, defend itself, be strong and all those things, and still be... Uh, um, uh, uh, you know, keep a sense of identity or, uh, or, or way of life that it values. And I think before, you know, throwing that overboard, we should start putting that back at the center of political debate again. So it, uh, one of the issues when it, talking about Europe is especially, but, you know, it has its resonance in national debate, is this neoliberal consensus that, you know, politics is just about uh, costs and benefits and markets. It's not. It's about protecting and modernizing and revitalizing a way of life, um, however that term is poisoned by the current um, von der Leyen Commission. Um, uh, so I think before you know, throwing out the child with the bathwa bathwater, we should try to reflect on the fact you know, maybe it's a child, but we need to uh, how we're going to raise it. Uh, what can we do to cultivate that open society? I think there's plenty of room to to uh, to discuss that. Okay, but isn't it natural that uh, you said the way of life and change is necessary? So, uh, you know, China bringing in some sort of economic and cultural change, then why is that not a, just a natural way of Europe also being more integrated into the world economy and uh, all these things? Right, so, so I think it is a natural thing that, you know, when the balance of power changes in the world, um, all interested parties, all, all, all parties, uh, um, change because of that, and identities change 
um, in, in coherence with that. Um, but that doesn't mean it's a, you know, and this is something, uh, uh, the, the, for instance, the Chinese state is propagating quite explicitly, quite purposefully, that it's a law of nature that this should be the case. I mean, uh, the, the, the great advantage of living in a democratic society is that we can, you know, in, in venues like these, um, uh, develop opinions about, you know, the direction we should take and then s try to start to influence that we take that direction. So it's nothing is set in stone. Uh, I don't believe history has a direction in that sense. We have to make it. Um, so uh, I think it's natural, change is natural, but we have to, we'll have to decide what kind of changes we want and uh, what directions those changes take. Um, and that debate has still to start up. Um, and that's why the rise of China is so exciting because it doesn't just ask questions about, you know, how China works. It asks questions about who we are and who we want to be in the world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I think I, I would tie in into that uh, with, with, with an example of w what happened, especially in uh, in Serbia and and, and Montenegro, um, as of uh, welcoming Chinese investments. Was that uh, if you think about the countries, those are the, do the two countries are the uh, most uh, in advance of getting you know EU uh, membership uh, in the next 10 years, let's say. And uh, what we found out was this kind of a paradox that, you know, on a certain, on, on one hand, China is trying to, you know, reach those countries as soon as possible, um, perhaps to, you know, be very, in, you know, very close relationship with those, those countries will join the EU table. Mm. But on the, on the same hand, uh, on the other hand, uh, when uh, China invested in those in those countries, it tackled certain infrastructure project, and, and, and the way it did business um, um, had actually a different impact, and that those countries were actually coming uh, back from that idea of integration into into you know um, um, into distancing themselves from that membership. Mm -hmm. So this paradox of of of, of clash of you know uh, one might even call ideologies, but at least you know from a path of EU integration to a path of welcoming different investment, but not following the integration um, has become something that uh, we yep. were quite not sure what to think of. So, so Kissinger adopted this biological concept of co-evolution of species evolving uh, through interaction with each other. Um, that might be a very a useful concept, but it, it, it does require an active, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, well, co-evolution implies that it's a natural process that happens anyway. So it's species doing their thing on a day-to-day -day basis and then ending up completely changed. I don't think that's true. I don't think it's a law of nature. I think we have to uh, evolve the way we want to evolve. That's, we have to do the work. Mm -hmm. yeah, so maybe that this evolution can be to the benefit of both Europe and China. So sure. China is facing many domestic economic problems, such as household debt, slowing go growth rates, lack of innovation, and possibly poor ho uh, human capital. By linking its economy more with Europe's economy, do you think that it aims to overcome these structural problems? I believe, that I, I believe that, yes. Um, for a long time, w when we were researching China and Chinese you know, investments or, or foreign p uh, policy activity, the idea or, or, or one of the core um, um, foundation of, 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 of that um, um, study was that you know, uh, Chinese foreign policy reflects domestic policy. Sure. Yeah. And um, as of now, I believe that th this is a way for China to, uh, if I may, evolve from that idea and, and build relations, or uh, might be economic but also political for sure, that uh, when, because obviously China cannot grow forever, when the growth stops or, 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 or slows down, due to those relations that it has outside, it can overcome these problems domestically. So I believe that, that this is kind of a way of, of also tying in into the Belt and Road Initiative to um, you know, get connected to perhaps the European market, which is <coughs> almost the biggest market in the world, and then because of that yeah. connection, being able to overcome any domestic problems. Yeah, and I think, uh, um, uh, I mean, I think especially human capital and innovation issues in China are, are um, overestimated, I think. So I think it's, it's come along a lot farther than Europe often thinks it, it has. Um, so it might be less enviable, enviable of, of Europe than, than, than we would like to <laughs> believe. Um, uh, and I think it, it, in the context of the, 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 the Belt and Road Initiative, it, it, and also made in China 2025, um, which uh, sort of sets out a, a plan for China to become um, a, a dominant player in the, in the sort of the 10 
most uh, important high-tech industries of the coming decades. Um, there is a logic that isn't just domestic, so it's about becoming um, not independent from the world, but it's becoming, you know, uh, it's, it's, it really reaches back to Western imperialist influence during the Opium Wars. It, 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 if, if there's one leitmotif in, in uh, um, Chinese foreign policy, is being, it is being able to uh, get into a position that it can't be touched like that anymore. Um, so uh, I think it's, that is also a very important motivation behind its so-called geoeconomic or global economic initiatives. It's that you know, it's, it wants to open up to the world but become less dependent and especially less vulnerable to the world. Um, and that's not just about domestic economic flaws or uh, insufficiencies. Um, it's, that is a geostrategic mm -hmm. and indeed a very deep historical mm -hmm. motive. Right. And, and, oh yeah, please. No, uh, only just a quick re reaction that if you think, for example, of the 16 slash 17 plus plan initiative, that's exactly, I think, w the way of, you know, China dealing with a region that is so different. You have V4 states, you have the Baltic states, you yeah. have the Western Balkans. All of those countries are very different. China had, for example, in the Western Balkans, no, uh, no experience whatsoever in, for example, dealing in issues of, you know, uh, different cultures, different uh, different approaches to mm -hmm. politics as well. But nonetheless, it took all of this region, which obviously served a strategic purpose of the end point of, of the Belt Road Initiative and connected to the European market, put it together and started a framework that is actually now working, mm -hmm. especially as we see, for example, that, you know, uh, the, the last member, uh, first of all, that it's actually open to new members com welcoming Greece, mm -hmm. but also uh, of establishing, you know, a, a platform of, at least talking point. Yeah. So there is a massive win-win opportunity in linking the two economies. I would say so, uh, but it all comes down to the to the to the point of whether uh, we are looking at the same win-win opportunity as China is. Yeah. And also, I mean, yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> I think you put it very uh, succinctly there. I think, and, and, and so there is a w an opportunity for win-win, but despite especially Chinese rhetoric. Um, China isn't going to do the win for us, mm. so it's going to make sure it gets its own win, but our win we have to <laughs> put in there ourselves. Okay. And, and one aspect of uh, all we've been talking about is, of course, Xi Jinping's rise in, in China as, as its leader, and uh, you know whether it's what we talked about with the European economy, protests in Hong Kong, the social credit system, there seems to be uh, an aspect of trying to encroach upon several spheres uh, in the world. So to, to what extent do you think uh, Xi Jinping is the most important part of this story? So I think he's a symptom mm -hmm. of a party that um, was growing increasingly anxious about its own survival. So I think we often underestimate the extent to which the Chinese Communist Party is uh, afraid that it won't survive the coming crises. Um, and um, especially during the, the reign of Hu Jintao and also Jiang Zemin before him, um, it saw corruption growing in a way that, you know, beyond the, the, the <laughs> um, in a way that was starting to pose a real existential threat to, to the party, at least in the eyes of, you know, the party leadership. It, w it saw, you know, the, the Arab Spring giving all sorts of examples of, um, I think what Chinese leaders would say, uh, leg legitimate regimes being thrown, uh, thrown out uh, because of chaos and Western interference, um, uh, which isn't how I would frame it, but I think that's what the Chinese leadership was, thi was thinking. I think it was getting increasingly worried about the effects climate change might have on Chinese governance and the status of the state, uh, um, uh, of the CCP. So I think there was a couple of, and, and Xi Jinping calls these the gray rhinos and the black swans. So the, the, the gray rhinos are the big issues that everyone sees coming, but you know, are too big to really, uh, no one wants to step, step forward and, and, and tackle them. And, they, and the black swans are the big sort of financial crisis like um, unexpected events that might, you know, uh, as, as um, uh, Nassim Taleb, uh, who, who wrote the book Black Swans, says can topple a seemingly robust and dominant regime in a, um, like Lehman Brothers, um, uh, like that. 
So I think he's, the party is incredibly worried about that, and in 2012, between 2010 and 2012, it decided it needed a strong leader mm -hmm. uh, to you know, guide its way through it, and it would accept the fact that that strong leader would then you know, um, punish and, and uh, um, uh, get rid of a big chunk of that party leadership uh, um, in uh, uh, efforts to you know, get that kind of power, but also revitalize the party. So it's, that's what, why Xi Jinping was chosen. Then there were other candidates. Um, and I think Xi Jinping was chosen because he was a moderate. He didn't really have an opinion. He was of aristocratic blood uh, within the context of the Chinese Communist Party and, and other reasons. Um, but he really is the instrument of a bureaucracy trying to survive mm -hmm. in an increasingly uh, volatile and unpredictable world. And how different would Chinese uh, foreign policy look like if uh, it wasn't headed by Xi Jinping? And well, else? so if so, if we were still in the Hu Jintao era, for instance, I think I don't think Hu Jintao would have been able to um, really rebrand Chinese foreign policy in such a unified and 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 strong way as Xi Jinping has done with the Belt and Road Initiative. So it's, I mean, lots of those things were still going on, um, but to put you know one strong brand on it give it a recognizable strategic face and, and then also use it to actually uh, get those strategic aims rather than you know, serve the interest of various uh, uh, local bosses or, um, uh, uh, or other politicians. I think Hu Jintao wouldn't have been able to do that. And it's not so much because of his personal leadership, but because of the kind of position that you know, the, the, the party leadership and the party bureaucracy has given Xi Jinping that you know, wasn't available to, to Hu Jintao. I mm -hmm. can agree more, and also I believe that Xi Jinping himself, uh, even before becoming president, presented the Belt and Road Initiative as his sure. flagship project, and, yeah. and, and it actually became that. And you know, this this kind of uh, China reopening 2.0 is is what has been driving Chinese foreign policy ever since. So yeah, and I it's I mean, it's it's in in a way it resembles the 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 kind of like the way of governance that the emperors of old uh, like to use, uh, namely, you know. Um, positing this, or you know, throwing out there this this big term, and you know, announcing it with all the grandeur and, and important rhetoric that goes with it, and then uh, you know, the rest of the bureaucracy and companies trying to actually fill it with actual policy. So that's, I think, uh, Xi Jinping is actually a master in that kind of sort of ruling through storytelling, um, creating the narrative space, for instance, that of the old and the new Silk Roads, and having a new big strategy, to not necessarily set something new in motion or to come up with a completely new policy initiative, but to really enforce and, and unify all these different currents that were already changing uh, the world in China. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, I think that's really, you know, the, the kind of role he plays within the party and he's really good at that. Okay. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn to the audience again for any potential questions. Oh, we have a few. Okay. Uh, lady over there first. Thank you. Uh, so you have mentioned about uh, different European member states would have different approach uh, towards uh, Chinese investment and the difference is um, particularly big when it comes to Northern and uh, uh, the North Europe and uh, South Europe. But we know that even like within Western European countries, there are different attitudes. And so my question is about um, uh, the, the role of Dutch government in this process. And some would argue that uh, in the post-Brexit era, that uh, the Netherlands, as a traditionally pro-free trade country, uh, would be more pro-investment you know, and would be uh, pro, you know, uh, w w would say that we should have less regulation. But if we look at the China strategy that recently have been published by the, a few major parties in the Netherlands, you don't really see that trend. So my question is to you that in your observation, you know, uh, where does Dutch government uh, stand in this process? And also, also, I think on the other hand, the Netherlands is also trying to seek for uh, seek for more uh, impact within the EU, given that uh, they have been starting this um, uh, uh, this this uh, Hanseatic uh, league with the Northern European country. So, um, in your opinion, when it comes to uh, China dealing with China, um, do you think the Dutch government would? take a strong stance on that, or 
uh, would it still trying to you know keep kind of uh, uh, neutral role in this process? Okay. Thank you. Uh, can we get one more question uh, before we answer them? A uh, gentleman over there in the blue shirt. Um, the question is particularly on the business side. So you mentioned the uh, unfair trade terms between the EU and China when doing businesses. Indeed, but the business groups in Europe have long, since 20 years, have long recognized the risks and returns doing business in China. Companies like Airbus or uh, BMW have long been doing, doing business in China since 1998, 1997, ten, a couple of years after it has opened. And after all these years, it actually has achieved a great amount of profits. And until today, the question would be, would you think that European multinationals at this particular econ macroeconomic context are more dependent on the Chinese market rather than the Chinese side uh, dependent on the European uh, technology and innovations? Thank you. Shall I, shall I take the first one and you'll Please. take the second one? Um, so the, the, that's a very, th that question about the Dutch government in relation to changing standards concerning free trade in Europe, um, provoked by China, I guess, uh, is a really good one and a really current one. I, I don't think, so I think the, the, the um, in general, the Dutch government doesn't know yet. Uh, so it's, this is a, a matter of, of big debate internally and, and uh, uh, you know, in The Hague, uh, but also more and more in, in public and political debate. Um, generally, I think you're a a absolutely right that uh, Holland is a, uh, at heart, a free trade nation and will try to push that agenda uh, also in Europe. Um, but I think the China strategy showed and, and yeah, the China strategy showed that it can't be just that anymore. Uh, and I think Brexit is, a, is a, an important reason for that, although that wasn't mentioned, of course, but I think uh, it is now setting its hopes uh, in, um, you know, recognizing the, the geopolitical importance of um, investing and taking a more state active approach to, to economic development and industrial politics. And you know, sitting at the table uh, uh, with that discussion and trying to um, get Germany and France not to go overboard with uh, creating, creating, you know, European champions when it comes to AI, for instance. So I think it is where it is, it, it, it recognizes the importance of uh, industrial, uh, European industrial policy, European inv innovation policy, and, and sees that it has to sacrifice some of its sort of laissez-faire free trade standards. Uh, but, and it's trying to, you know, uh, um, not have France and Germany have all the say in that. So I think that's basically what it's trying to going to do in the in the coming years. For uh, as so far as that, you know, it, it already knows what it's going to do. Um, yeah, as a general rule of thumb, I, th I think that's what's going to happen. Um, yeah, I agree as well. I think that especially, you know, again, it comes back to the idea of reciprocity. Yep. That for multinationals, of course, uh, the role of China is, is incredibly important. It's an incredible market. Um, and uh, uh, for example, even for the Czech uh, company Škoda, which is making cars, mm. uh, the Chinese market is the one where they're trying to, 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 to enter. But at the same time, Škoda is part of Volkswagen. And, and that obviously uh, ties into the fact that for even for Volkswagen, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a huge market, China, to be at. But um, uh, the problem is then for you know smaller businesses um, or mid-sized businesses that uh, would like to enter China, yeah. there is no reciprocity in, in, in that uh, business relations, and that makes it so hard for them that they are rather staying staying within the European market. But uh, also to partly answer the first question, uh, on in the case of the Czech Republic, for example, th the problem is that um, a lot of uh, the marketizing of, of, of EU, uh, Czech, uh, Chinese relations has come down to the fact that uh, not all of the investments that were promised actually came. Mm. And that made it um, not also a sensitive issue, but also 
it kind of divided the government, the president, and our prime minister, slash foreign minister, on the issue of China, because then it became that mm. for one side, it has been promises of business and, 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 and other investments. On the other side, uh, for the Czech Republic, the biggest partner, trading partner, is still Germany, yep. and will be forever, almost, uh, I yep. say, because uh, pretty for to the connection that we have, the two markets have. So uh, even when we talk about China being a strategic partner for the Czech Republic, uh, it's often forgotten that China in, in actual trade is even below South Korea, for example. So yep. we have other Asian uh, investors that are actually being more uh, present in the country than China, but those are not as, as visible as, as China is. Yep. So it comes down to the question of how to market this relationship and if it's actually uh, a successful one, then, um, th then of course it becomes uh, it less sensitive than uh, this idea of it being really successful, whereas no investments are actually coming into the country. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you for your questions. Uh, unfortunately, we have to wrap up the interview at this point, but uh, we have one final question. Uh, so, Mr. Dams, you also mentioned uh, something Kissinger said previously, and uh, another kind of argument he's made that he fears Europe might end up becoming sort of this far end of a China uh, dominating the entire Eurasian continent. Yep. Do you see this uh, as, a, as a, and my question is to both of you, is it a far-stretched fear or do you see us all speaking Mandarin anytime soon? <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, speaking Mandarin wouldn't be the worst of it. I've, I've, <laughs> tried, to, I've tried to learn Mandarin and I know some uh, and it's been in, an incredibly enriching experience. So I would, I would certainly not see that as a um, uh, uh, as a sign of a, of a Europe in decay. Um, but, uh, so, I mean, I wouldn't go as far as, you know, Kissinger, Kissinger loves to throw around these big, uh, uh, big images because that, you know, those, those big, you know, uh, scary futures ask for an elder statement, a statement to sort things out. And then of course he enters the room and offers to do so. Um, um, uh, but, you know, again, looking at, Boris Johnson's United Kingdom, and you know, thinking of even if he is able to stay on and get Brexit done, whatever that means, um, he is going to have to find you know a huge amount of foreign investment and trade um, from China and the U.S., and he is going to have to bridge uh, a huge divide in political rhetoric and um, ideology and moral standards between those two and between what it, I think what it means to be British or at least what it means to be European. Mm -hmm. So I think if, if you want to, you know, we don't have to go as far as the kind of world Kissinger paints um, to uh, have a, a, an image of worry or a, a reminder of how important it is to have what is called strategic autonomy because if we don't have that, we might look as silly as Boris Johnson already looks. I mean, that's, and that's quite embarrassing, I think. So um, maybe not Kissinger, but Boris Johnson would be my um, realistic. I mean, if, we, if we're going for a exit, that's the least of what's going to happen to Holland, I think. Okay, and what do you think, Mr. Legazo? I, I think that just considering the fact that, you know, the end point of the Belt and Road Initiative is Europe, is kind of what our sense is. We are still, you know, a, a player in the game, and uh, even though if, uh, you know, rising China is definitely a, a concern, especially when it comes to the influence it has over investments, uh, uh, and both economic and political, I believe that there is still a place uh, for the EU to become, you know, um, rather important player still, and uh, that place is definitely united. So uh, as long as we are able to b come up with a um, common approach to China, be it one of where we screen investments, what we do it properly, uh, then I'm sure we're still going to be at the table. And I think it, it again comes down to um, do you believe you can forge your own future or do you believe you're sort of bound up by history? And I think Kissinger is the kind of, and, and uh, uh, maybe that attracted him so much in Chinese political thought. Um, belongs to the kind of leader who believes that m for the most part you're, you know, bound up by, by history. So, and you have to just go through the motions and uh, play out the game as it, as it has already been set for you. Um, and I don't, I don't share that view. I think, you know, in our relations to China, it's, 
again, it's the kind of future we want to forge and uh, um, we'll have to make together. So it's, I, I guess it's that difference. On that note, sadly, we've reached the end of our interview. I'd like to thank both of our guests for being for such a wonderful discussion here on our stage. So could we have a large round of applause for both our guests? Thank you.